I'm Ian Hempseed from Hempstons. I'll do introductions in a moment, but a, a warm welcome. I'd say to some familiar faces. I mean familiar names on the uh, on the list who I know have come to some of our previous uh, webinars. This is the third in the series, so welcome back to you and welcome to others who haven't been on the two previous webinars. Uh, we're, we're delighted to be teaming up again uh, with uh, Baxendale and I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment. Just to uh, say how we're going to run this afternoon's session. We're going to talk for about 30 minutes, then we'll take questions. So in the usual way, you can raise uh, your hand. But please, uh, whilst, you're, whilst we're talking, uh, feel free to put anything in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll pick that up um, after the 30 minutes. Can I ask everyone to mute themselves if they're not speaking? Uh, we will be recording this, so if anyone uh, is concerned about any comments they made, they don't want them to be recorded, can you please let us know and we'll edit them out. So I'm uh, Ian Hempseed, I'm Head of Charities and Social Enterprise at Hempson's. We're a national uh, law firm with offices in London, where I'm based, uh, Harrogate, Manchester and Newcastle, and we provide a full uh, legal support service to charities and social enterprises. And one of the areas of support is um, around um, uh, mergers and reorganizations, and we get involved at all stages of the process. This session uh, this afternoon uh, is very much, it's all around, uh, first of all, recognizing that stakeholders can have considerable power uh, when you're doing a merger. What we'll be looking at this afternoon is how you can harness that power and why it's so important to do so. You know, at one level, it's to ensure that you get a successful merger, and we've talked a lot about integration in the previous webinars. Um, and secondly, it can be absolutely essential uh, because uh, unless you get some stakeholders on uh, side, it may not actually happen. So I'm now going to um, pass over to, I think, Kerry first from Baxendale. Kerry, I'll let you introduce yourself and then I'll, I'll let Jim, Jim do likewise. So um, over to you. Thanks, Ian. Hello, um, my name's Kerry Jones and I am the Managing Director of Baxendale Advisory and I'm uh, delighted to be here this afternoon. Um, Back to Mail Advisory, as some of you will know, is a consultancy specialising in supporting organisations to transform, thrive and grow. So we work principally in areas including service design, uh, commercial growth and increasingly in mergers and acquisitions, which is why we're here today. Um, we are an employee owned organisation and a B Corp and very much focus where our efforts working with organisations in health and social care and the voluntary and third sector as well. I'm going to hand over to you now, Jim. Well, I'm Jim Brooks and I lead on Baxendale's merger support offer. Uh, I'm an accountant by profession uh, with a background in corporate and not for profit finance and strategy, mainly in the health and care sector. In terms of merger experience, I've supported projects in the corporate and charity sectors over the past 20 years or so, as well as leading on NHS mergers as well. Uh, that said, I mean, every merger project that I've been involved with has been subtly different, so I'm still still learning. Uh, that's me, and it's great to be with you all today. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a very quick cautionary tale uh, and share some screenshots from the Coventry Telegraph website of all places. It relates to a proposed merger of two independent schools in the area, uh, Bab Lake and King Henry VIII schools, both very old, well-established independent schools, and it shows what can happen when stakeholders are not aligned. Can we go to the next slide, please? OK, so it's October 2020 and the merger has been announced. Uh, all good so far. Next slide, please. But by February 2021, just a couple of months later, the Charity Commission confirmed that they were looking into the proposals 
And that was because stakeholders, including parents, had complained to the Charity Commission about the proposed merger. And next slide, please. And what we can see is that by April 2021, things are starting to go horribly wrong. We see reports that campaigners were, campaigners were preparing to launch legal action to stop the merger. And that's continuing. It's an interesting story to watch if you go onto the Coventry Telegraph uh, website. Uh, it's, it's unfolding as we speak. And all we can say in terms of a takeaway to that is, is all we can say for certain is that important stakeholders were certainly not aligned and that there's now a big problem for those leading that particular merger. Go okay, to the next slide, please. So it's not just the charity sector that sometimes struggles with engagement. This chart is based on uh, corporate experience and it's also quite telling. So in a survey, 2015 survey of executives involved in in corporate mergers in the US, 90% of respondents agreed that engagement is important. Um, surprise in some ways, although it's not 100%, but 90% agree that it's important. But only 43% said they thought engagement on their merger projects was successful. So the question is, why does, why does this gap exist? Um, so it's also telling in, in that it shows us that engagement can be hard, a hard nut to crack, even for people who do merger for a, for a living. If we could go on to the next slide, please. We can see here a few reasons why those respondents felt that engagement on their merger projects was ineffective. So inadequate resources, too slow in terms of the process itself inadequate management attention to it, not all groups being engaged with, so some being missed out completely, inconsistent messaging, starting the process too late, not planning it well, not doing it frequently enough or, or ending it too early. Now, a couple of those stand out based on our experience in the health. I think they're all true. We, we, see, we see them all the time, but a couple that stand out based on our experience in the health and charity sectors are uh, particularly starting too late. This can be, I mean, it can be a tricky one. There's not much point in engaging before there's a merger idea or hypothesis to test with people. But that initial idea does need to be tested fairly early on and then amended if necessary. Uh, Ian, do you want to come in on that? Yes, yeah, so you, you've, you've tested the idea. You think you think it's worth running with. Um, and where problems can arise if, and it covers uh, a lot of these, not engaging with all stakeholders, starting too late, not planning well enough, is there could be legal consents you need to obtain. Not, not always, but often that you will find there is some uh, consent required. So it's important to identify at the evaluation stage what consents are required you need to put the legal as well as the wider stakeholder engagement in your project plan. You need to identify how long it could take. If you go to the Charity Commission, I'd set aside three months to be on the safe side for that. Um, and you need to start thinking about this is about being well planned. What, when we go to someone for consent, what's our case? Do, have we actually got the information to support that case? And which ones are we going to prioritise? This again is down to planning. Are there any consents which are a red line if we don't get those? So we need to prioritise and particularly uh, plan for those. I'm going to pick up on the later slide, uh, give, give examples of where legal consents would be required, and I'll say more then. So I'll pass back to you, Jim. Thanks, Ian. I think the point about engagement not being well planned certainly jumps out for us too. And, and here we, we often see this manifest itself in inconsistent messaging. For example, you know, if one entity's staff um, are getting great engagement, but the other party's not being engaged with at all, or maybe receiving conflicting messages, that's a, a big problem. It's also worth noting that, poor, you know, the poor planning in relation to staff engagement can also lead you to, 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 to you failing to identify cultural misalignment, uh, therefore missing the opportunity to address that early on. Uh, I think before we move on to the next slide, Carrie, do you want to come in and add anything on that one? Sure, thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, I think I think particularly the staff engagement point is really crucial because failing to support them through the journey 
can result in a real risk of potentially losing staff through fear. But also, if you do doing the groundwork ahead of integration gives you the best foundations to build from in a merger and gets you, you know, as Jim said at the beginning, this is about often about strategic change and it can get you through that change curve a lot quicker if you have engaged early and understand what you, the challenges that you're dealing with. Inconsistent staff engagement and communication throughout can lead to low morale, create real misunderstanding, missed opportunities and mistrust and ultimately employees feeling deflated, which is a really poor foundation obviously to move forward and generate the anticipated benefits that you had hoped to generate from merging. And I think this is further exacerbated if it's been uneven between the two organisations. So where one group of staff have been well communicated and then on integration, you find that the other group haven't and there's that inconsistency between them or inconsistent messaging. They've taken away different bits and have a different understanding of how the integration journey is going to is is going to progress. As Jim mentioned, uh, and, and the evidence shows cultural alignment is another really crucial part to merging uh, to successful mergers. And again, engaging here with staff is crucial to be able to understand that cultural compatibility. And by that, we mean things like how decisions make decisions are made within an organization. So who makes the decisions, how they make them, how quickly they make them, the values and behaviors of different organizations hierarchy are they hierarchy are they very flat working norms is one a flexi time organization and is one you know very much nine to five does one organization wear suits does one organization wear bermuda shorts it's those kind of things that are the kind of cultural indicators for how compatible two organizations might be and whilst and understanding those from the outset can allow you to plan for them. So it can allow the merger team to assess the risk that cultural alignment might present, but also plan for how this can be effectively addressed in the merger integration progress and process. And we'll cover a lot more on that a little bit later. OK, so, so those people here who were at our first two merger webinars will be familiar uh, with with the with the, with the with the stages of, of merger that we, we which we talk about. In fact, if we move to the next slide, please. Um, we 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 use this framework when we were discussing what happens at each stage of the merger projects. And I'm, I'm fairly sure that these slides and, and, and those previous webinars are available to, to view. Um, so, so what we've got here is we've 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 got three phases. We've got joint evaluation, uh, which is where the merger idea is uh, is developed by both parties, hopefully leading to a decision to take things forward. We've got transaction execution, uh, where the legal and constitutional matters are dealt with, um, leading to the formation of the merged entity. And then we've got integration or other post merger integration where the actual change takes place through a process of cultural alignment, uh, which uh, Kerry has just referred to and, and organisational transformation. Uh, today we're going to focus in on stakeholder engagement, but I think it's useful to see this in the context of these three stages in the merger process. So we, before, before we get in, in, into that, it's worth saying something about the nature of merger projects. You know, they absolutely are all about big strategic change, change that impacts a number of stakeholders. And for that reason, project objectives are as much about getting agreement and buy in as it is about hitting specific milestones, as you would see in a kind of a normal project. Uh, and this is particularly true at the first stage, the joint evaluation stage, where it's where it's important to track the extent to which the idea of the merger is being supported by various stakeholders as you go. In fact, project success at the joint evaluation stage equals agreement by all key stakeholders that the merger makes sense. That's really a good, that's a fairly good working definition of success at that stage. Uh, that will hopefully be an agreement that the merger should progress, but it's an equally valid outcome at this stage to conclude that the merger shouldn't proceed at all. That's the whole point of that particular phase. Um, of course, stake, stakeholder engagement matters at the transaction execution and post-integration stages as well. 
The transaction execution stage is about transacting or doing the merger deal. And this is where you really find out uh, if you have the support you need, uh, whether that's board members, service users, staff, commissioners, funders, members or regulators. Uh, Ian, I'm sure you'd like to come in at that point. Yes, no, um, certainly, Jim. So if, if I just focus a few moments on where you might le need legal consents and why that's so important to actually make the, the merger happen. So um, two phases at the evaluation phase, that is when you should be identifying as early as possible what legal consents do we require, prioritise those uh, by starting with those where a refusal would be a red line or could you manage refusal by a plan B, what's plan B? Who is going to be responsible for getting the consents and what are realistic timelines? Because you need to build that in when you plan your target date. When you come to the transaction, that's all about getting the consents. And I think some of the best advice you can have is don't rush in to get the consent. Be well prepared before you approach anyone for consent. Be clear on your reasons. What are your objectives? Have you a strong case and a good story to tell? So I'm now going to merge evaluation and transaction stages together and just give um, a list of some examples of where legal consents would be required. Um, this is really in the spirit of a checklist, and if you go through it, you might be delighted to find that actually none of them apply to you. And in some mergers, none of these will apply to you, but unfortunately some, they might all apply to you. So you need to do a lot of planning to get through it. So just to give you some examples, Let's start internally. Are you clear who has to make the final decision? Some boards think it's exclusively them and then find out too late in the day they've actually got to get their members involved because the governing document says if you if you dissolve transfer, that's a members general meeting. Um, so check your governing document early at evaluation. Um, if you are going to have to get members approval, the actual approval is the end of the line. You need to do lots of consultation with your members beforehand, and we have seen mergers fail simply because boards do not consult with the membership. And an area of challenge we've seen is where you have had no need to call a members meeting, apart from maybe AGMs, which no one turns up to anyway, and aggrieved people have an easy way of challenging your decision because they say you hadn't kept an up to date register of members. Um, if you're the acquiring organisation, you're changing your name, that could be another instance where members approval is needed. If we go on to a regulator, so let's take the Charity Commission. You might need Charity Commission consent if the objects of the two organisations aren't aligned or if you need to amend the uh, dissolution clause. And sometimes you need what are called Section 105 orders from the Charity Commission where you have common boards and you need to manage a conflict of interest. Occasionally you have charitable trusts involved which might have permanent endowment and you might need to get a scheme from the Charity Commission to appoint the uh, acquiring charity as the new trustee. I don't know if anyone here today is also uh, registered with Oscar, the Scottish charity regulator. Unfortunately, the rules are very different. Uh, they don't talk about merger, they talk about amalgamation. Um, if you are thinking of amalgamating, even if you don't need to change the objects, you need to get the regulator's consent in Scotland and there's a strict timeline of 42 days before you decide to go ahead. You must make the application. Some of you or you might be involved with um, federated charities. If you are, uh, probably the consent of the national charity will be required and there's probably a process to follow. And finally, look look outwards to what, what are where are your key business operational relationships? Because their consent is probably going to be mandatory if you want to continue those. So landlords consent to transfer a lease, a key grant. The grant funder might want to do due diligence on the acquiring organisation. Are you commissioned to provide any services? What you don't want is the commissioner to refuse an evasion of the contract and say we're putting it out to tender. There may be other key contracts where you need contract holders consent. What about a bank? 
have you secured any of your assets to the bank? If you have, the bank will need to consent to release them. And one area we've found missed out is where increasingly as organizations collaborate, what you want to make sure that if you are a member of another organization, let's say consortium, that your membership will be transferable to uh, the, the, the merged um, entity. Don't forget personal data. Are you sure that uh, your database of personal data is transferable without consent? And Kerry's mentioned the importance of staff engagement. I'll, I'll just uh, provide the extra layer that uh, if it's a transfer of an economic activity, you need to do a Chupi consultation. So that really is a gallop through a checklist uh, which may catch you. In, uh, you may not be caught at all, but you should be doing this checklist as part of your evaluation due diligence. So back to you, Jim. Wow, thanks Ian, that's a lot. Um, okay, so moving on to the right hand side, the integration stage. Um, this is where the engagement uh, focus becomes heavily weighted towards the staff team. Uh, the, more, the merge has gone through on paper, uh, but it's only going to be a success if teams become aligned and transformed to achieve the merger benefits. And this is my opportunity to pass over to Carrie again. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. So, yeah, absolutely. This is where the staff team and particularly the full senior teams who are crucial. And it's, you know, it's worth remembering here that they may not have been fully involved in the process at this stage. It may have been managed by a smaller team on behalf of the two organisations with representatives from each, or, and often certainly for charities, this would be heavily trustee based. So it's at this point, bringing that wider staff team on board and, and engaging heavily with them is crucial. So this is things like developing understanding of each other, um, understanding each other's cultures, strategy, strategies, operating structures, engaging with them to shape the joint ambition and priorities for the new, new venture going forward, collectively developing what the right operating model, and also things like determining what the best way to get there and things that will support the process. So things like if there is going to be a management selection process, allow them to jointly determine what that is so that you haven't got that negative sense about a merger um, to the same degree. And this can both generate the better results, limit some of the damage that can come as a result of any organisational restructure. But it also means your leaders are then in the best place to cascade this through the organization. And ultimately, that's what change, strategic change management is all about. And, and that is the end case of mergers. So if they have been engaged in shaping this, then they're going to be in a much better place to cascade that through the organization and support that change filter through from top to bottom. OK, so three, we've spent a long time on that slide. I think the three takeaways there are emerges as significant strategic change projects. Absolutely. Uh, key objective at each stage is to secure stakeholder support for the change, particularly at the first stage. Um, stakeholder focus shifts at each stage, but the need to engage does not. It's something that continues all the way through. Uh, if we could move to the next slide, please. OK, we're going to look at a framework. We're going to get into the nuts and bolts now of what engagement looks like. Um, if we go to the next slide. OK, so. Um, we're going to finish, finish the presentation part of this webinar uh, with, with, with a look at the framework that we use to guide engagement. Um, and we use this at all three stages of, of, of projects we're involved in. It's used differently at each stage. But the flow and the basic idea works quite well. Uh, it can be used in an iterative way. Um, it, it can also be used in, in, in an iterative way within each stage to ensure that stakeholder feedback is listened to and acted upon. So it's a loop. And that's particularly helpful at joint evaluation stage, uh, the first stage in our merger sub process, when the strategic rationale for the merger is often work in progress and, and in development. Uh, for today, we'll step through the process on the assumption that we're at the joint evaluation stage of a merger project. So starting with box one, top left hand corner, is about assessing strategic objectives and implications for the merger. 
Uh, all all engagement should start with some, something to engage about. It, it, it doesn't need to be a particularly well-formed or polished strategic rationale for the merger, but there does need to be something to engage on. Kerry, would you like to talk to this one? Absolutely. Um, so really, at this point, stakeholders can play a really crucial part in verifying your strategic case. So really in testing whether the assumptions you are making for the grounds to merge, um, whether that, for example, is better access to funding, the ability to grow into new markets, greater influencing if you're a campaigning organisation, you know, great, you know, better capabilities. How the stakeholder engagement can be part of the process in verifying those assumptions because it's all often often they are as I said they are assumptions as in the, there isn't a, the evidence behind them and, and what the strategic case needs to do is build that case so be assured the two boards of trustees that that a case is right and accurate and that's where engaging with stakeholders can help to test that process. So having the conversation with funders, with commissioners on, on whether or not they could see that this could support a, a growth model for a new entity, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the crucial part of this stage. Thank you, Kerry. Box two, scope current phase in the merger process and anticipate issues and risks. So based on the emerging rationale for the merger, it should be possible to highlight or second guess some of the issues, red lines and risks. Some of these might be of more concern to one stakeholder group than the other. Moving on to box three, which is stakeholder mapping and analysis. Uh, certainly important to try to see, and I say try to see the issues and concerns through the eyes of different stakeholder groups. That said, you won't really know what people think think until you ask them, but you'll probably be able to make some reasonable assumptions. And again, Kerry, please. So, yeah, absolutely. There's the mapping you do up front of your stakeholders is, as Jim said, it's something that you will come back to at every stage and you can use as a tracking exercise in order to support this. But really, up front, it's used to anticipate how key stakeholders may feel about a potential merger and how influential and important they are in its success. So in any project, any kind of project, different stakeholders will have different levels of influence and importance in the success. And that is by no means any less in emerging, in fact, probably more crucial. Stakeholders obviously being anything from staff, trustees or board members, depending on the organisations, your funders, your beneficiaries, um, potentially patrons, politicians and policymakers if you're in that space, commissioners if you are funded in that way, um, competitors, they are the kind of organisations that you would want to identify here and spend some time anticipating how they might feel about a merger and how important and influential their opinion is going to be in the success of a potential merger. How crucial is it that you have them on side if you and and, it, and often what you'll find in this process is that some are quite neutral and you don't need to spend as much emphasis on them. But as um, Ian illustrated in the legal and regulatory section, there are a lot that you probably wouldn't necessarily think of as key stakeholders that may actually be much more influential in success than than actually you'd anticipated. So doing this mapping exercise um, and anticipating those issues is really crucial. Thanks, Terry. So now we're on to box four, establishing the overall uh, engagement strategy. And by this point, you should already know why you're engaging. Uh, it's because you want stakeholders to come with you and help you shape the merger journey. And I'm going to go straight back to you again. <laughs> again. So again, this is, you know, it's part of the same plan, but it's got to be there. Once you've identified who they are and where you believe they might be, um, with regard to supporting the merger and where you need to get them to, the next part is really to identify, develop your engagement framework. So who is the best place to be doing the engagement? And what is the process to listen, understand, uh, gather feedback, gather their opinion? And it will be different for different stakeholders. You know, there will be some crucial ones that really do need that senior one to one face to face conversation. Others, it might be a survey or something like that in order to ascertain how they feel about it. Um, 
but this is the process that needs to be done. And again, coming back to that first point I made about staff engagement, it's got to be replicated for both organisations and done in this following the same format so that you're again not having that inconsistency in how you're engaging uh, between both parties. Thanks, Carrie. We're right in the middle of this um, uh, diagram now, number five, de develop and approve materials and channels. So a lot will depend on who you're engaging with and what came out of the stakeholder mapping. So the materials might include briefing notes, survey questionnaires, etc. Uh, we, we find that focus groups work really well for stakeholders such as staff who've got a high degree of interest in the merger project. Uh, the point here though is, is to prepare well and match the approach with the people you're engaging with. It's not a one size fits, fits all obviously. Uh, box six is about briefing the people that will be leading on the engagement. I think there are probably two related things to think about here. Firstly, making sure that anyone who's leading on engagement is properly prepared and supported through that process. It can be challenging. And secondly, making sure that the people going out to engage are broadly speaking on the same page. Uh, there's, there's nothing worse than going out with different messages. Um, Almost there now, so on box seven, begin, begin the coordinated engagement with stakeholders. The key word here is coordinated, uh, particularly when it's necessary to prioritise one particular stakeholder group in terms of the timing of the engagement, and that can often be the case, or perhaps where stakeholder groups need to be engaged with at the same time, such as staff teams at the, at the merging entities. Almost there on box eight, fast tracking responses to all feedback and, 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 and any Q&A. Uh, this one is super important because engagement is, is, is only really of value when you have time to use or act on the feedback. The sooner you get the feedback, the sooner you can act on it. And that, that's particularly important uh in in the uh evaluation at the kind of joint evaluation phase where you may need to do more than one cycle here uh finally on box nine capturing the learning and, and and evaluating the feedback capturing what you learn from the engagement and using that to inform your merger strategy is what this is ultimately all about so don't do all the hard work uh, and then forget to and then forget to close the loop and use the information and let it inform your merger strategy. So I think that's us now. Thank you all for listening to our presentation. I hope it's been really helpful. And I think we're now going to open this up for Q and A. Thank you. We've had one um, question and comment in the in the in the box, um, which is: At what point would you start? recommend starting if too early I assume there is not enough to say and can cause unnecessary limbo when there are no answers yet okay okay so so yeah I think this is a particular we, we kind of alluded to it earlier on it's, it's a real a really tricky one you want to engage you want to engage early you want to involve your stakeholders but if you don't actually have anything to engage on it gets messy pretty quickly um, because you don't, you, you, and to put it bluntly, you don't know really what you want to say to people. So, so having, having the confidence, I think, to have an initial, even if it's another of, of an idea, having a, a rough strategic rationale for why you're spending your time doing this in the first place is is a good starting point. But it's it's an art rather than a science. There isn't a, a, a you know, it's difficult to give a clear answer. Kerry. Yeah, I think it's at the point where you are exploring it in earnest as in you have actually got teams and think looking at this to the point of really exploring whether there is a strategic case here and I think when that work is when you've moved from the initial conversations do we think this is there's something here to uh, actually we've got a team working on this now I think that is the point where you probably need to start engaging with people um but it isn't, you know, it's a grey area otherwise. But that, I think that's a good way of kind of determining whether or not you've got beyond initial exploration to actually properly. This is something that we are seriously consider, considering. Our boards are aware of it and we've got a process. And if anybody else has any any other questions, please do put them in the chat box or if you'd like to unmute yourselves and ask your questions of the team, then please do so. 
think it's also reasonable to say that if anyone has any has any questions they want to ask, but they'd rather ask them in a, in, after the event. We're, we'll be staying on for a little while after the event, so we can do that too. I'll, I'll read this out. Um, Joe has put, in terms of our intended merger, I have always talked openly to the staff about the ambition to do so. This seems to have been a successful methodology. Do you have any comments about this approach, please? Only that I think if you have that kind of dynamic with the team, then absolutely that's what you should follow. It's, you know, it, it really is dependent on the kind of you know what kind of culture you have as an organization and if you are able to have those kind of open conversations about where future strategy might take you and what that might mean then i think it's a it's a it's a good way to you know to be as open as possible you know exploring mergers are you know generally it's a, it's good practice to think about it and if you can be open with your team about doing so i think it's it's all the better for it thank you for that thank you and the only thing I'd add to that is it, it's great. I'd agree with everything Kerry's saying. I think if you start, once you get start moving into exploring specific, I don't know where you are in that process, but if you're, if you're having conversations with potential merger parties, partners rather, um, you'll need to make, you'll, you'll want to make sure that that kind of approach is also happening there. Absolutely. As that we spoke about earlier. Yeah, absolutely. We've actually set up the project team um, was started down the process of due diligence. In Yeah, so in that case, it is just ensuring that the other organisation is being as open as you are, because obviously that is where tensions can happen later down the line, where one staff team have been totally involved and had open, transparent information all the way through, and the other hasn't. And yes. also where, you know, just misinformation can spread so quickly and Absolutely. if you aren't having that united comms and engagement approach you know different bits of it can be interpreted in different ways and, and I think it's just about how to avoid that and the anxiety that that generally can result in. Yeah we will be setting, we will be setting up some joint um, Q&A sessions and pre yeah. sessions as we go on. Brilliant. So well, I, I, I've also seen as some friction develop. Yeah, you know, this is where the cultures of the two organisations are different. Yeah. And it just is almost at the earliest stage of even pre-transaction when someone says, here's a non-disclosure agreement, sign it. And the, and the, the other, the other organisation prepares it and they say, uh, we're only going to talk to two people in your organisation and we don't expect those two people to discuss anything with anyone else in the organization. And we have seen very restrictive NDAs mm. like that, but that almost gets you over the due diligence around, do we have aligned cultures? Yeah. So watch out for NDAs, because some of them are, and it may be they've been written like by lawyers like me, who just, <laughs> you know, that's how we start off and not from Kerry's approach, but. Uh, <laughs> um, A good question though. Really good. There's a hand up. Want to come off mute and ask your question, please. Oh hi, sorry, I realised I didn't have my name on there. So my name's Kim. Um, I, I was wondering if anybody added any advice on do. Uh, so uh, so there's potentially a, a well, a, really a takeover. To be honest, of to my organization taking over two small organizations at the same time i didn't i wasn't i wondered if you had any tips on multiple <laughs> all at once um and has any has anybody done that before <laughs> i know that every i know that it has been done before but are there any particular things that you think we should be thinking about there well, that's a real tr really tricky one um i have recently um been involved in a, a full way merger actually uh, but they were kind of similar size and I think the complexity here is that you're talking about are they much smaller the organizations yeah much much smaller um so so they combined together they are the size of like one service area of my organization I mean we're not a very big organization our organization is sort of one point seven million and they're like one's like 80 grand and one's right. like 300 grand so it's so they are quite teeny tiny but they're very similar in their nature so they're very 
they're really similar organisations. Um, so I think Kerry would probably be best to talk about the kind of engagement stuff. But I guess as a kind of a, a merger type practitioner, I, I would I would say even though they're small, uh, doing them at the same time yeah. uh, sounds like a big uh, you know it sounds like a lot. It does it, it, in some ways it, it doesn't matter how small they are. The fact that you're going to be running two kind of acquisitions or takeovers at the same time uh, can, can 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 be a, a real drain on on, on management resource. Uh, but but I, I suspect Kerry, Kerry is probably better qualified than I to talk about engagement in that scenario. I mean, I think the principles on engagement apply here. It's about really planning it well, but it is trying to coordinate it as far as possible. So it's consistent across the two, um, even though one is tiny and certainly tiny compared to you. It's just, again, making the process as smooth as possible and good comms and good engagement is such a crucial part to that. Um, and it's it it's designing a process that makes them feel that although it is ostensibly a takeover or that you know they're being integrated into you that their voices are heard that their value that you value what they're bringing to your organization and ensuring that those kind of messages are are being heard because you know you're 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 wanting to acquire them for a reason that they're adding value to your organization and i think it's really crucial that even when they're small, that their that their ability to uh, you know contribute to that is heard, but that's a core part of the messaging that, and they're hearing it before they come in and once they come in. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I suppose it's a little bit easier because they're desperate to come in because <laughs> that's a good, always <laughs> they, a good they, place they, to start. They, they, they both have, they've approached us, and I think their staff feel quite relieved to maybe come in so that I suppose that's an easier starting point if absolutely and then it is about the integration stuff so I... how do you ensure that they don't stay as separate divisions within your organization and almost like ostensibly a little tiny organizations within your organization but actually get brought into that and how can you plan for a, an engage a, you know a change process that allows that to happen so that they they are assimilated rather than operating as little divisions within within you and almost stay independent but within within your structure and I think that that just is all about bringing them in you know at a senior level to conversations it's looking about that operating model it's looking at cultural alignment it's it's all about those kind of things so looking at your operating model and how they can be brought in in a way that really does assimilate their strengths and what they're bringing to your organisation but it's certainly a good place to start that they want to and they've asked to. And would Not you just... be bringing together maybe people from each of their each of the three boards to come together? Well the boards what kind of structured organisations are they because yeah, one's, are they a charities or are they? one's a charity and one's a CIO and we're a charity. Yeah so yeah oh, how's sorry, the how's the yeah, how's the other charity? Is it is it a company or is it a trust or? Uh... Uh, it, it's, it's the, the, the other charities are the same as us, so it's a, it's a registered charity and a company limited by guarantee. OK, OK, fine. Yeah, yeah. OK. Um, so just just to um, sort of add to what Kerry was saying about integration, we've certainly have seen quite recently actually an organisation that did something similar and not at the same time, but took over two smaller charities that wanted to come in to the organisation. But what they did is they kind of they didn't integrate them, and they're kind of paying. They are very much paying the price for that now. Uh, mm. in, in that they've they've kind of left them to run on their own because because they're small it's okay and they've left them to run for too long now and now it's becoming a bit of an issue as they really do now realize that they do want them to be integrated so I suppose the other bit of advice might be to sort of not underestimate the the kind of integration challenge. And I on your question about sorry Ian um, yeah. about boards. And I assume so boards of trustees as they won't be transferring, I wouldn't mm. limit it to conversations with them once the decision has been made, because they're not going to be coming. It is the staff beneath them that are going to be coming. And so ensuring that at, once that decision is made, that you have that you are engaging with them to support them on that transition, I think is is crucial as well as the board. But, but in this yeah, case, yeah, once yeah, the decision has yeah. been made, wouldn't limit it there. Yeah. I, I, I have I have seen mergers done where uh, places seats on the board are made available 
to charities coming in. Um, and that's fine. But one of one of the problems I've seen is that uh, people come in as constituency rep. They they're not they don't understand that they are actually going on the board to look to have oversight of everything the combined organisations doing. Sometimes people think they're just coming in as a legacy custodian of their former organisation. And if you have too many legacy custodians on the board, you haven't got a board operating effectively and you could actually be going backwards. You'll be operate. You'll have a board operating in three silos. So mm. by all my means, invite people in, but only if they're going to strengthen the governance by the board. Just going back to your original question. So we, 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 yeah, we have been involved where there have been sort of a, a merge, more than one merger acquisition takes place at the same time. Um, again, it's, it, it comes down to just looking at the structure of each charity. If they're slightly different, their governing documents are slightly different. They may say it's a board decision. The other may say, no, we've got to go to members. Um, so you you can't make assumptions that because one charity can merge in one way, the other can do it the other way. So you will need to do a bit of due diligence to see mm. if you can use the same route in uh, mm. for both. I would hope you could if it's a CIO and uh, come limited by guarantee. They'll both have dissolution provisions, so they should be fairly similar. But you just need to do some basic checks. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Thank you. And is and, and is it a firm such as yours that would be in a, a good position to advise on different potential legal structures that could yeah, be no, that, it would be could be explored as you know as opposed to like a full on takeover? No, so, so I think we discussed it, didn't we, Jim? In the either the first or second, uh, uh, we 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 talked about options. Oh, for I didn't. Like I structure. didn't see yeah. that. So yeah. Didn't. So we well, we can send you the slide. So yeah, that's exactly you know Baxendale, uh, us on the legal side, we're often called in to whether it's a fully integrated merger or there's some halfway house or maybe a halfway house for an interim period as you get to know each other more closely. Um, maybe collaboration as an initial stage and then so the, there are different ways of doing it. It depends on structures and sometimes, yes, we're asked to um, give that initial appraisal. Um, so we can we can we can send you the slides from either the first or the second webinar where we looked at a couple of options and their evaluation. Oh, that's 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 great. Thank you. Well, he Heather, if uh, is, it seems that uh, there, there aren't any more uh, questions, so do you just want to wrap it up and just say what we'll follow up with? I, th I think you've, you've posted the chat already about it. But, I have, uh, yes. Well, uh, along with the slides from today, um, we obviously also add in the links from the previous webinars as well, so that everybody has, uh, has the full set. I know that some pe people have already attended the other ones, but I think it might be useful for those who haven't to just see the other ones. So we'll add those into the follow up. Thank you very much.